it's doing to prepare. They got like hamsters spinning on wheels until Probably. the uh, juice kicks in. All right, live on Facebook. There we go. Hey guys, how are you? I am so happy that you've all joined me. Usually this is a Libertarians in Diners drinking coffee, but since we have the coronavirus that is just like destroying us all, um, well, at least they, we say it is, uh, we have decided to do Libertarians basically in bunkers. Um, I'm drinking coffee. <laughs> So I'm being good. I'm still kind of staying on brand a little bit. I have with me today uh, my friend, uh, my fellow Marine, an amazing guy who's been who's been pushing this message literally for years, who has been out there through thick and thin. The man himself, the man running not for president, Adam Kokesh. How hey, are you? Thank you so much, Larry. Outstanding. I, I really appreciate the opportunity and being flexible with your format for me. Certainly interesting times we suddenly find ourselves in here. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that, you know, I want to talk about and I and we talk about often is the idea of either localization or decentralization. I mean, you and I talk about this all the time, this idea of how do we get government down to the local level? And with the crisis right now, there's a dichotomy, right? There, there are people who are saying, oh, my God, federal government, come save us, come save us. You're the answer for everything. Tell us what to do. And at the same time, you find now governors saying the federal government can't help us. Local people do stuff, but it's too late because we've stopped them and stifled them for so long. And now the local people are even trying to come up. And we're talking about this same idea. It's a problem, but it, it's an I told you so, but not an I told you so, right? <laughs> right. So please talk about that. Yeah. Oh, man. I am. I have so many I told you so as I'm holding back on right now. And I'm, I'm piling them up for like a couple months from now, you know, when, when people aren't losing their heads over all this. But let me, if I may, start with a sort of general coronavirus disclaimer. Mm -hmm. I probably have it. You can't get it from watching this video. OK, no, that's that wasn't what I meant for the, the important disclaimer here. But yes, I'm, I'm on the bus. Uh, no Force One on the road. We are heading to a uh, quasi bug out location, centrally located. Uh, I'm with my uh, driver, Clover, and my wife, Samantha, who's here on the bus listening in right now. And actually, we're, we're, we know that we've been exposed. Um, both Sam and I think we have it. Clover thinks he's had it in the past, uh, like, like a few weeks ago. And it's something that we take seriously, but are really working very hard to put in perspective. Uh, sure. Right now. And it's so important. And I, and I want to say this isn't out of uh, trying to dismiss things or the seriousness of this. But yes, we do have to put it in perspective. Sure. Compared to the people killed by government on a regular basis, compared to 22 veteran suicides a day, compared to the seasonal flu. This is not a big deal. That doesn't mean I don't have absolute compassion for everyone who is, uh, you know, hospitalized or, or feeling real health consequences as a result of the coronavirus. But obviously, the bigger threat here is the reaction, is the response. And I think it's very yeah. important for us as people who haven't lost their minds to say, look, calm down. And it's like, when, how, how does that work? When people, oh, we've been frightened uh, of death now. And it reveals not only you know, within our movement, how many people really believe in these principles? Well, I'm a libertarian, except when it comes to this, except when it, except when the president of the United States declares a national emergency, then I'll give up my libertarian principles. And it's like, no, no. Whoa. Hey, <laughs> you were passionate about that one. I, got a little excited. <laughs> I love it. I, I, this is, this is what, yeah, this is what I'm excited about is that, that people are. But, but hold on. Let, let's touch that piece if we could, right? There, sure. there, there's a concern I have. It's a little bit off topic, but Let's touch this now. There's a concern I have that the average American who doesn't normally hear our message, right? Who normally sits around and watches CNN or Fox News or MSNBC and normally watches that. And right now is at home because they either can't go to work or whatever. They're watching that six hours a day now, right? And that's telling them the answer is on high president, you know, help us, give us an answer. They're hearing that. And then when they hear you say, guys, calm down, guys, relax, let's put it in perspective, which is a logical answer, no doubt. The emotion of hearing the world's ending six hours a day has got to affect right. them. How, how yeah. do we get around that without them thinking, oh, these libertarians, they're just jerks? 
Well, I think part of it is just that we have to be ready for when the attitude shifts. And and to what you're saying there, that that's most Americans. I I I I want to kind of I want to dispute that a little Please. bit. You know, in, in the sense that uh, first of all, we've seen some statistics already coming out on surveys, and it's funny. What are we primed to do as a society in responses? Measure partisan opinions. And with, well, Republicans aren't as likely to go out to, or, or Republicans aren't as likely to heed the warnings and are still gathering in groups and going to church. And Democrats who are hearing from the liberal media and the anti Trump freakers and going, oh my gosh, Trump hasn't done enough. That they're, they're, it's like 30% of, of Democrats plan to uh, go about their lives as normal, whereas it's 60% of Republicans. And you go, why is why is that what we're paying attention to? Mm -hmm. Most Americans, while they see what you're talking about, Larry, and they're going along with like Gavin Newsom's, uh, you know, mm -hmm. recent partial law declaration for California saying the whole state's on lockdown, New York, similar, you know, shelter in place orders. And it's not it's not hard martial law, partial martial law, kind right. of soft martial law. It's enough that, well, if it's on the TV, I guess we kind of got to go along with it. But like I was, <clears throat> uh, we're, we're actually, we're at a, at a truck stop right now with a loves mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, we went inside last night for, uh, for some Arby's okay. and, uh, Mac and cheese, decent vegetarian option there and, uh, jalapeno poppers. This is not a corporate sponsored interview, by the way, but, uh, we, you know, we went in and, and people are, people are pretty calm people, you know, people are talking about it. People are still having fun going about their lives. And I, I think most people here are being led, misled mm -hmm. by political leadership, by the media, but a large chunk of them aren't buying it. You know, they're going to have What's that problems. large chunk? Is that large chunk 10%, 40%, 60%? What do you think that chunk is? You have a, you have a gut feeling to what that no, percentage is. It's 70% of Republicans and 40% of Democrats. That's a lot of people. The, the inverse of those statistics. And, and it's not as, as clear cut as that. That, that. The survey question that I read yesterday was, you know, are you planning on avoiding large gatherings because of the coronavirus? Only 40% of Republicans said yes. <laughs> the majority of them are, are thinking somewhere along the lines, well, Trump originally said it wasn't a big deal. And then he probably got bullied by the bankers and the Democrats into declaring a state of emergency. Now, I have a slightly more, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> sorry, it's that Corona cough. Um, I, have, I have a slightly more cynical view of how all presidents make decisions and that he might have been bullied into doing this, but it's more like he saw a financial opportunity. He saw an opportunity to increase the power of government, to rip people off, to pay off his friends. And... It's, it's really a question now of was that what last we, piece. Hold on. Was that last piece? Was that an anti-Trump, anti-president, anti-what? I want to be clear on what you just said. What, what, oh, what was uh, that? All, the, all of the towards? above. All, all of above. the above. In the okay. sense that um, now some people will say Trump is the best, best president we've ever had. Uh, but, you know, government has continued to grow. Freedom mm -hmm. has continued to shrink. I will say the general trend of viciousness declining over history of government has continued under Trump, although it has gotten worse in those ways. Trump is not really special in, in the, the sense of there's a, there's a, you know, uh, uh, a, a, a chain of presidents who have come mm -hmm. throughout history. And every time, uh, you know, humanity wakes up a little bit, we get a little more aware. The evil that they're able to get away with goes down a little bit. I mm -hmm. think that general trend has continued under Trump. You can say some things have gotten better, sure. But the mentality, first of all, that it takes to become president of the United States is give me power, give me money. I'm a psychopath. Let me just unquestionably bring resources and power to myself. And that's the when you're competing against people like that, unless you're advocating as libertarians as we are for something that is fundamentally different. Sure. That's the game you play to become president. And as president, you know, you're subject to all of these manipulations. Sure. I, I like the, I, I, I put a lot of. Uh, stock in the the Bill Hicks understanding of the presidency. He says, you know, when you get elected, they they take you into a cigar filled, smoky room. Yes, I've heard and this. It's yes. all the, he says, he, if if I may curse, you know, Hicks says these white old industrialist capitalist fucks, and it's like, yeah, uh, 
and then, then a screen projector comes down and the, 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 the video comes on and they, they show you a shot of the Kennedy assassination from an angle you've never seen before. Mm-hmm. And then they say, any questions? And the only one you're allowed is, what's my agenda? Well, at this point, I think Trump is particularly subject to that kind of manipulation because the mainstream media has created this sense of panic. So to, to your question going back, there's this incredible surge of emotion that is yes. dominating the conversation. Absolutely. And, and, and maybe maybe half of the American public is just kind of like, uh, really? And they're, they're kind of on the fence about it and half are going, oh, shit. And then, you know, I think I, you know, people like you and me might be right in the middle where we're paying a lot of attention mm-hmm. because we see that there is a greater threat from the government response. And this is not a heartless thing. There are, excuse me, two reasons why I think it's incredibly important that we fight the hysteria, we fight the government response, and we minimize the overreaction. And the first one is the legitimate threat of the coronavirus. Sure. And there are a lot of problems with overreacting lessening our ability to deal with it rationally and one Mm -hmm. is the actual panic that leads people to go to emergency rooms when they don't need to yes like 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 me right now i'm i've got and by the way i i seriously believe that that i have the coronavirus for right now that i am experiencing i'm not joking about this i really believe i have it um i i've had and and it just came out i saw a drudge report last night half of serious coronavirus cases involve intestinal uh, diarrhea type issues that I've been experiencing. My wife's here going, oh my God, Adam, why are you getting into this? Um, <laughs> she's had it worse. Don't worry, baby. I won't tell them about your symptoms. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I have, I have the sore throat. You're making enemies in your bus, Adam. You might not want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> not in my bedroom. Yes. Yeah, no, but I, I have, I have the sore throat. I have a little body ache. I have a little bit of a fever. And it, it, if, uh, you know, it was any other time, I wouldn't even think about anything other than, oh man, how do I get back in the gym and get over this and get healthy and, and get my metabolism revved back up? No, this actually affected us, right? You were supposed to be in New York doing this. Yeah, right. Well, that's, right? We, that's had, all, we had yeah. planned for you and I to be in New York doing this. Yes. Right. And, and, and to that, you know, the main reason I'm, I'm not going to New York right now is that I'm afraid uh, people in New York and, and Larry, I, I got a lot of respect for what you sent me by text message. You're not going anywhere. This is your city. It's my you know, city. I, I love that because it's your community and you want to yes, be a is. part of that. You want to be there to help people. Personally, I think I can do more good helping people get it. Not, not being stuck on lockdown in New York. Yes. Uh, you know, being Adam Kokesh carries certain legal liabilities with it. Uh, this would be a really bad time to get arrested, especially in New York city. Yes. So, I'm I'm just avoiding that, you know, logistical threat represented mm-hmm. by that. But so to this point, because people are uh, overwhelming hospitals with relatively petty health is- issues that they shouldn't be going in for, we are less capable of taking care of people. Mm-hmm. Because the economy is taking a dump, yes. we are less capable of taking care of people who need to be taken care of both in hospitals and in quarantine. Really simple logic here. If there are, you know, 5% of the population most at risk who need to go into quarantine and everybody else goes into quarantine too, well, then the really vulnerable ones are going to die because they can't take care of themselves in quarantine because we can't deliver food or medicine or whatever else to them. So the overreaction here is absolutely insane. So and, and then the, the second thing uh, about, the, you know, why to be afraid of the government response and this is this is one of those things that's kind of tough to hear right now when people are well people might die no response is too much we heard uh, governor cuomo coming out and saying you know look if, if we i am willing to do whatever it takes if it yes. saves one life and you're like oh 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 that is the scariest thing to hear yes from it is because if they well we're gonna save one life today by by marshalling more medical first of all by the way, it's nonsense the free market does a far better job, even in an emergency, of redistributing resources to meet immediate needs than the government ever could without the negative unintended consequences that are the disasters that come out of this. So, Mayor, well, let, let, let me touch that piece you brought up. It's a great piece you just brought up. The idea of how do we react with logic? How do we service the people to be serviced? How do we allow both the market and the government to function 
this is what you and I both went through. And, and a lot of people don't understand why in the Marine Corps, when we do training, they put us through the gas chamber all the time, right? They make us put our yep. gas mask on all yep. the time, right? I don't know how to time. panic. Yes, that's the whole point, right? <laughs> you literally get gas so you don't panic. So that when a chemical attack hits you, you keep your head, you put your gas mask on, you deal with the burning, and you still function. And you can yes. function as a Marine in a horrible environment. You can function because the war doesn't end because it's a biological attack or a chemical attack. You take your wounded back, you then regroup, you then counterattack. Yep. That's what yep. we do as Marines. We've been taught that forever. And to your point, I know you and I think that way. But a lot of people aren't getting that, that if we don't respond effectively now, not only does it affect us now, but we're also not ready for the next one. And there will be a next one. This isn't the yeah. last virus we're ever going to deal with. There's going to be another one. And if we don't function well now, we're not going to function well then. And I think uh, on a more national concern, if, if I'm in Iran right now, I'm not thinking about making nuclear weapons. I'm thinking <laughs> biological. Right? Uh, yeah, look at weapons. A lot okay. easier to make biological weapons, and it crushes the American economy, right? Yes. Now, you, now, just now, I, I, this is again where, as libertarians, we have to remind people that when we say we care about the economy in a crisis, it's because we care about people. Yes. Most talking heads, when they say we have to protect the economy, we have to give bankers trillions of dollars and bail out major corporations for the sake of the economy. You know, most Americans get the idea, well, when assholes talk about the economy, it's to make the rich richer and the poor poor. No, that's not what we're talking about as Correct. libertarians. When we say we want the economy strong so that we don't freak out on this second point, it's because when the economy is weak, again, we can't take care of people who are vulnerable. But I would, I will, I, I, I this is, this is, I hope, I hope not too presumptuous a bet at this point, considering we have not descended that far down the path of martial law. But I think it's a safe bet to say right now, more Americans will die as a result of the response to the coronavirus than the virus itself. And when we say we want the economy to be strong, we don't want people to suffer. It's not just, hey, someone's going to lose their job and they're going to have to go on government assistance. Well, first of all, we all know hashtag socialism kills more than Corona. It's not just stock prices are going to go down. When the market goes down and the economy goes down as it does the way we're seeing now, when everybody in the service industry is basically not allowed to work, yes. restaurants and bars shut down, it's not just, oh my gosh, there are going to be people in unemployment. Oh my gosh, we're going to have to help people with food delivery. No, it means that people are going to die. People yes. are not going to be able to afford basic life, quality of life, maintenance, medicine, other medical problems are going to be exacerbated. Children are going to go to bed hungry. Yep. Chronic health issues are going to get worse. There is going to be a wave of deaths from the lockdown months from now, continuing to cascade as we see the ripple effects throughout the economy. This is not just doom and gloom. This is recognizing that there, there's a real threat to quality of life as a result mm -hmm. of this. So Larry, if, if I may, I, I want to kind of, I want to turn to interviewing you and, and, I, and, I, and I want to, uh -oh. to, to call, yeah, I, I want to call on the uh -oh. audience for some help here. If, if I may have a minute to sort of lay things out. We've all seen the graphic, right? Flatten the curve, right? If oh we, yeah, if, if, everyone's if we, talking about that. If, 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 if we, and, and that's the justification for, you know, all, and, and we can do that. And actually I like the, the, the graphic that got famous about that because it said, stay calm, wash your hands. You know, but it didn't say actively resist martial law because it's going to make things worse. There's this whole other threat that's probably worse than the virus. And it says, you know, if we don't flatten the curve, we're going to see a spike in cases right. and it might come down afterwards. But the problem with that spike is the strain on the healthcare industry. Yep. Lack of uh, the, sufficient the beds, the, med, the hospitals. hospitals. Beds, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. All ventilators issues with that, all of those things. And this is this is, you know. I don't want to refute it because it shouldn't be refuted. This is true. And we would be better able to flatten the curve in a reasonable way without all these crazy side effects if the president came out from the beginning and said what I would have said, hey, uh, you know, let's take care of people who are vulnerable, support them quarantining, let's up our self-care and our sanitation game, and, and let's actually get out and, and, and be 
more vibrantly engaged in our communities and in the economy and making sure that we're capable of responding rationally and taking care of people. This would have been no big deal. This would have been uh, as it should have been uh, dealt with a kind of a very bad flu season. And some people are going to argue, well, Adam, you can't compare it. Yeah, you can. And, and, and that's the, and, and would it be a lot worse potentially? Um, and all just to, to address that specifically, the death rate, people are saying 3.4%. We know already, and we're seeing the counter narrative come out. That's among people who have gone to the hospital. Yeah, you know, but that's I, no, not... no, I want you to go back to what you said, though. And don't, don't, you, you, you teased me. Yeah. Just all right. All right. So here yeah. we go. Stay here on that. Flatten the curve. Yes. So this is the important thing here. Uh, there's a whole other trend line that we're on right now that is very disturbing. That is the increase of martial law. And if the American people come out and say. No, this is bullshit. I'm sorry, Governor. I'm sorry, Mr. President. You're full of shit, and we're not going to go along with this. We're going to flatten the curve of. T we're going to put our foot down right now and say, "Look, you are not helping. You are making things worse, and and you have no excuse to violate individual rights." You it, and this is back to libertarian ethics, which is basic human ethics: don't hit, don't steal, don't kill. Not unless you're a cop, a soldier, or an IRS agent. You don't get to violate individual rights with the excuse of, hey, there's a virus out there. You have a right to disassociate. You have a right to freedom of association. If you want to be on quarantine, you have a right to do that. You don't have a right to put someone else on quarantine to preserve your right to, to control the world outside of your own body, outside of your personal property, outside of your home. So if, if, we, if we flatten this curve of tyranny, then we're still, now, by the way, with the flatten the curve with the virus model, there, there's a hump and it comes down and it goes down to, to next to zero. The tyranny curve, the martial law curve has a much worse tail effect. Because right now, what we have seen from the economic consequences, the, the, they are going to be with us for a long mm -hmm. time, possibly years. Yep. Just what we've already experienced. If the bans were lifted tomorrow and everything went back to normal as much as possible the economic impact of this would at least last you know in in obvious terms something on the scale of three to six months i gotta this, tell you this is an important piece adam that from our last crash 2008 we never fully recovered from that and it's been 12 years right so imagine you yes. add on top of that what you're talking about right. i mean if we don't, all we did in 2008 was say, Fed, crank out more money. That was basically our only issue. And we're seeing the, the, the fragility in our economy from that because a big chunk of our economy was millennials spending money on stuff, not owning things, but instead spending on things, buying $4 coffees, $5 coffees in the gig economy. Right. You know, everything is rental. Everything's at Netflix. No one's buying TVs. They're renting furniture. They're renting apartments. <laughs> Everything is renting, renting, yep. renting. No ownership, right? So no actual building of wealth, but right. instead just spending, spending, spending. And now the Fed keeps pumping money. Well, now the, the Fed doesn't need more money to, to pump. And now we've stopped the gig economy from rotating. I mean, it really has been a smash. And interest rates down to zero are going to make things a lot worse. And, and I don't pretend to be any kind of expert on how that system works or the immediate repercussions. But I know when the Federal Reserve says, hey, we're not charging interest anymore, have some free money. Yes. But yeah, first of all, it benefits their friends a lot more than you. 100%. It benefits the bankers, the corporate interests. It benefits those at the top of the economic pyramid. And it is a crime. It's fundamentally criminal. It's theft. It, it, taxation is theft. Inflation is theft. It's all ripping off you well, it, as someone. It hurts our vulnerable even most because the people who get that money at the highest are the people who are somehow on public assistance. Because yes. that money goes through everything and then back and then finally goes public assistance. So the people who need the money, if we care about the people who need the money the most, their dollar has the least value. And the big bank, their dollar has the most value. Yeah, and you mean social security, welfare, Medicare, all those Medicaid. things. But, but Really, anybody on a fixed income, Correct. anybody whose income is based, on, especially you know, in the service. And again, you know, this is where like my heart breaks for all of my friends in the service industry for the, that huge chunk of America who's getting screwed over more than anybody else right now. 
So here's here back to the chart. Yeah, please go ahead. If we don't flatten the curve of tyranny now, it's going to keep getting worse. We're going to see more lockdowns. We're going to see travel bans. We're going to see possibly interstate driving uh, aside from truckers ban. We might see more significant lockdowns, more significant martial law efforts, more significant efforts to rearrange the economy. And, and some libertarians who, who are more conspiracy minded or, or pessimistic doomsday or mentality types see this curve actually spiking and, and getting worse and that, the, the, that this could still be accelerating mm -hmm. and getting to the point of long term martial law, uh, mandatory vaccinations government buying up companies we already see trump doing this see already thing. i think we see the beginnings you're right we're going to bail out companies and have the government take ownership it's like what like it, it wasn't an, I, I told you trump was a socialist from the beginning because he's continuing all of the socialist policies that the sure. government already had in place so why are we surprised oh now he's like full-blown socialist because he's got the opportunity in a crisis to increase well, government power with and, that and issue though there's a that people are, are asking questions about you running for president. I, I'm glad we spoke about Corona a bit, but I want to shift this a little bit. Oh, I got I got to finish this point, Lear. I got oh, go this ahead. Is really important. Yeah. So if if we go to this, uh, if we go to full lockdown, government control of the economy, martial law, uh, forced vaccinations, and this this spike of, of tyranny continues, the the tail is not even going to look like a tail. There's not going to be much tapering off. It's going to be, if, if it gets that much worse, we're going to be living in that state of tyranny. So it's a plateau. It, it, well, it's not that it's going to plateau. It's just, it's going to take a long time for us to get over before it starts tapering off. And we're able to go, hold on. What did we just let happen? It's going to be the start of a dark era for America of socialism, of centralized control and martial law. If we don't, level the curve we got to flatten this curve of tyranny of martial law and honestly other than getting this message out and telling people resist this is bullshit stand up to it go about your normal lives as much as possible i think there's already widespread civil disobedience happening of people saying eh, no because they're not really able to enforce it on this scale mm -hmm. they're not really it, it, the, the virus by the worst fear-mongering estimates is not so deadly that it's like some kind of zombie movie where people are running around, oh, I got the virus, I'm gonna bite you. You know, it's not like right, that. They're right. not able to get to that full lockdown. So I think it's really important that we encourage civil disobedience, you know, retaining consciousness of the legitimate health threat, but to say, look, if I obey, obedience equals death. The more we obey government now, the more people will die. And I, the reason I wanna turn this to you and to your audience is, other than that, I don't know. You know, part of me is like, ah, oh, let's go to New York. Let's go stand on the bridge and, and you know, make, you know, make a protest out of this. But that, that's like increasing the conflict. You know, maybe we'll go, we'll go to D.C. and we'll organize. Maybe there's a time in, in a few weeks where we have to organize a mass protest in D.C. to say the American people reject martial law socialism. We're not going to put up with this anymore. I don't know. And I'm really looking for help here for ideas for things other than than just speaking out. I'm going to go to a, a kind of bug out spot for myself and make sure that I have regular internet and water and electricity and the ability to keep broadcasting and getting this mm -hmm. message out, doing my now daily Facebook Live every day, 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I might be going to my property in Arizona where I've got 10 acres, but it's way more remote. I'm down three miles of private dirt road. Um, I have less amenities. I might, you know, it's going to, it would be a really uncomfortable place to bug out unless a lot of people join us with, with, with more supplies, but it would be the safest. You know, do we need to go to that level of protection? Do I personally, as, as a libertarian presidential candidate, and this gets to your question now, you know, how is localization relevant to this? And, and my circumstances as a libertarian presidential candidate who as a civil disobedience activist has always had a target on my back. Yep. You know, how do I handle this situation? How do we as a community who understand these dynamics and see this, how do we take leadership and, mm -hmm. and show people other than just like, hey, we're calm, we're looking ahead, we're, we're identifying the real threats, we're encouraging people to be smart. Yeah, <coughs> excuse me, I guess I, I have Corona too now. You gave it to me, Adam, see, you lied, it, it comes through this. So no, the uh, I, I think yeah, you're totally hey, right. Have a laugh, have a laugh. Absolutely. 
Well, you, you got to laugh in times of, uh, of of just absurdity, whatever the case is. And I I, I will the, the the people who deserve our wrath more than anyone else are saying, well, you can't joke about this. This is yes. serious. Oh, no, 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 no. You got to be able to laugh through all of this. Hundred percent. Yes. Yes. I I still laugh about cancer jokes, and both my parents died of cancer. And my and my parents were trying to have they tried to have a, a sense of humor until the end. My mom wanted to have quality of life, not quantity of life, and that was her way of doing it. And she was happy to have that. So I completely agree, hundred um, percent. I, I guess the the other issue becomes, as you mentioned, right? We do we bug out? Do we move to online? I see two sides of this, right? To to have impact, you want to have social media, obviously. You want to have traditional media but you also want to have events. You want to have all those things that get together to have impact in an election season, all those things. Now we're going to kind of lose the events, right? The physical events. We're going to kind of lose those because of the virus, right? People aren't going to come out as much. They may lock us down, but on the other side, libertarians are really good with social media. Like this has been the thing that we've been good at for years it hasn't until been that we're shadow banned <laughs> until we're shadow, said, until we're shadow on, banned, yes before before you continue i gotta put put in one more note here of, of things that are scary about this ron paul put out a great story i read it on my live on tuesday i shared it said must read from ron paul censored on facebook ron paul a doctor giving a professional opinion about this censored because he said one thing that they said wasn't accurate and they and it's it, it was bullshit. I read their criticism. Bullshit. So we're, to your point, we don't have to just be good on social media. We have to be creative and clever and looking at workarounds right now. Absolutely. Yes. So the question now is, is our skill set good enough? Right. How, how do we make the same impact when we're going to be crippled this year, losing or has, crippled's wrong and wrong, handicapped. Maybe it's a better word. We're going to be yes. we're going to be handicapped not being able to do the physical event. And you're an event guy, right? You drive the bus around. That's what yep. you do, right? Yep. You're an event guy. And now all of a Absolutely. sudden, they've just kind of taken that away from you and you're kind of handicapped. So how do we make that same impact or more with that? Do you have any content or idea on this? Other than just spreading that positive message, staying cool, calm, and collected, being funny and reassuring and, and you know helping people in our communities, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I, I think the, uh, you know, community service efforts that are coming out of this, that mm -hmm. we've seen people coming together, uh, you know, it, it sometimes at the building level, like in New York City, right? Yes. Where people are, are trying to stay quarantined in their apartment buildings. You know, that's beautiful. And, and, and to see people, uh, you know, taking charge in that as libertarians, I've seen a lot of great efforts where people saying, look, you know, I'm not going to be scared out of helping other people. I think that's really important that we get out and be visible and say, look, we're not afraid, um, you know, we're, whether, uh, you know, you're, you're immunocompromised or not to just keep a level head and be engaged, helping people where they really need it. And right now we're going to see a lot more people needing help economically. So one of the things that I'm, I'm excited about with this, you know, there are a lot of silver linings to this. Mm -hmm. uh, one is I think uh, there's going to be a flood to cryptocurrency when people see the yep. dollar losing value. Because right now there's a surge to the dollar in the leaving of uh, capital markets and the stock market, uh, people getting out of physical assets in order to have liquidity to be able to respond to a crisis. But eventually with the federal government's manipulations, we're gonna see the dollar losing value. Probably in the next few weeks, it's, it, I think it's, it's, it's got some strengthening momentum with the uh, going to liquidity right now, but it's very shortly go going to lose that momentum and the bigger factors of socialism and the uh, money printing. And yeah, but hold on now. You, you and I, you've been part of this physically, right? I only train people to go to war. You've actually been in war. And right. don't you know, I mean, don't you see that US dollar is backed by the US military, right? So if the dollar starts going down, aren't we like invading Iran or something? I mean, is uh. that like the thing to make the dollar strong? Isn't oh. that the thing that we do? When the Iranians say, well, the dollar is weak, so we should create the, the uh, Indo-Euro or whatever the thing is they're going to make to now buy our gasoline or whatever that is, is that a time that all of a sudden Marines hit the beach again? Well, I can't disagree with any of your 
premises there, but I think there's a lot more to it than that. And I'm much more optimistic that the countervailing dynamics of accountability with the internet, the general human historical decline in violence is, is very much connected to accountability of government through the internet. Whereas before it was very easy to lie people into war when they couldn't fact check it. Now you can. And the worst violence that the governments of the world can get away with are things like the global war on terror, the war mm -hmm. in Yemen, Afghanistan, Iraq. You can't have uh, a war with Iran when it's premised on everybody in Iran wants you dead. And so we have to go kill them before they kill us. And then you get on Skype with someone from Iran and you go, um, is our government crazy or are you guys? Oh no, it's your government. Yeah. It's, oh, sorry. We'll take care of that government thing. Um, I don't think they're capable of that kind of widespread violence to prop up the dollar. And when you say the dollar is backed by the military, Yes, it, it, the ultimate backs up of the U.S. dollar is that the government can use violence to collect it in taxation. And I think that's a lot more complicated, whereas the U.S. military is just a small part of that. It's the whole paradigm of the economy and the dollar having value more than that violence as the backs up of the dollar. What gives it value is the illusion that it sure. has value. And I think if we take away that illusion when the government is so incapable of using violence to back it up, we're going to see a crash of the dollar in a very positive way. Yes, there's going to be some economic upheaval, but guess what? Everybody in America who works in the service industry who was just told, hey, you're not allowed to go to work, they're going to be looking for economic alternatives. And I think cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, everything that we can do online provides a great alternative. So I, su I suggest that that is a silver lining in terms of a forced early economic adjustment that should have happened a long time ago. And now finally, Americans are getting shocked into taking drastic personal economic life, you know, changing actions. But the other big silver lining I see is that people are going to be able to do the numbers. It is, and people are right now are, are starting to get uncomfortable already with the lockdowns and, and the impediments on regular life. Give it a few weeks. I, I say give it a week. So you don't think that the lockdown concept will become the new norm? You think that's not going to, that, that eventually we're going to be like, you know what? No way. I went off. I, if, if we don't flatten the curve and things really spike in martial law, it's possible that it could become the new normal. Mm -hmm. I think it's highly unlikely. The threat of the virus is not enough. They have not convinced people that there is enough of a threat to really give up everything and give the government total Have you power. been watching TV recently? I've also been reading the internet and looking at the numbers. And like I said, if you watch TV, you're gonna get a sensationalized yes, view Yes, you of this. are. There's you literally a, a count number of the people infected and the people dying in the world in our country. It's, I mean, it's, it, yes, like you can go on to, oh, now 8,000 dead, 10,000 dead. I mean, it's, it's, it's and, and I would, I, I know this is almost cliche at this point, Larry, but I think you would appreciate as a veteran me saying, how dare those motherfuckers who are trying to scare you into giving up your rights and make our response to this crisis worse to blow up their numbers? How dare they have not been counting the numbers of veteran suicides Doesn't every count. day for the last decade? How dare they? How dare these motherfuckers come out and say, be afraid of this because it's going to make me rich. Ignore the veteran suicides. And I know that's just something for you and I. Uh, no, I'm with about. you. But you know what? There's so many other things, so many other, other, other life threatening things out there in the United States. How dare they? How dare they sensationalize this? They are going to get people killed. I will put it to you right now. If, if you're on, if you're, one of those people on CNN, NBC, ABC, one of the Fox, whatever, one of these, and you're, you're sensationalizing this, you're hyping this up, you're putting the death toll on the screen, you are personally responsible for the people who are going to die unnecessarily because of the economic fallout from your fear mongering. And this is the piece that I worry about more than anything. And we haven't really touched this, but you just kind of did, so I'm going to bring it in. And this is the idea that we're saying social distancing. It's not social distancing. It's physical distancing. 
It's not social yes. distancing, right? Yes. I still want people to call their grandma and grandpa. I still yes. want them to go talk to their friends. But yeah. now you do it via phone or Skype or Zoom or whatever. You want to not meet. touch. It's not Don't that touch. hard. Like we have, we have dealt with this before. We have dealt with all kinds of similarly contagious health risks. We go to hospital. You go to a hospital room with someone who's sick, who's contagious. You know, you don't go. Oh, I'm not going to go. You just, hey, I'm not going to kiss you. Like, yes. Hey, I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to shake hands with you and then pick my nose. Like, yes. It's not like it's. It, 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 yes. Thank you, yes. Larry. I, I, I should be saying this more. It, that is an important message that needs to get out. When, when my mom, I told you my mom passed the cancer, right? She she went through about a, about six months or so of chemo. And for those of you who know about chemo, it destroys your immune system, right? It's what it does, right? It, it destroys everything, cancer and you, right? Everything. Yeah. So she had her mask. And when my daughters would go see her, I wanted my daughters to see their grandma. When they would go there, I'd make sure they washed their hands every day. When they'd go out, and she'd always wear her mask. I'd have my daughter wear her mask. She was like six. I would still have her do it because I wanted to make sure, to your point, I don't want my, my mom to die or something like that, right? At this point, no one was talking coronavirus. This is six, seven years ago, right? No one was talking about this. It was instead just her health, her system was compromised. So let's act accordingly. And I think we did exactly the same thing. My worry about the social distancing, this goes to your point, and you bring up veterans when we think about this. You and I both know that there are many reasons, but one of the major reasons why veterans commit suicide is they feel alone and alienated. They mm -hmm. feel alone. Even when they're not, they feel it. Even when there are people who help them, they feel it. And if we now distance even more, we're increasing that. There's going to be more suicide, more depression, more pain, more people feeling like they're alone. And here's the worst part. And I tell us all the time, if you want to get these guys and people in your local community to do something, I'll tell you what they should do. Give them a mission. And when you want mission, go to your veteran community. They can't wait for it. They can't wait. Oh, my God. Give them mission. If, why aren't we using the, the, the American Legion as a rally point for people who need uh, uh, products? I mean, you know how many veterans would go out of their way who would literally leave their apartments and live in the American Legion to set up a supply center? They would yeah. do it in five minutes. Happily, yeah. give well, these people it. mission. Yeah, I well, hey, I I would say that's a legitimate call to action right there, Larry. If you're a veteran in America, if you're connected to an American Legion or a VFW where you have a physical community and a location where you can move supplies and 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 support your community for the people who are suffering, absolutely, that is a very important thing for people to be doing right now. And for a lot of uh, you know a lot of veterans on disability, uh, you know they're they're doing veterans community organizing anyway. This is a great opportunity for the veterans community to step up in that mutual relief uh, you know, effort. But I want to call attention to the bigger call to action here. Please. So flatten the curve of martial law. And if you're a veteran in America, I think you have to be ready for this. Uh, and, and I hope this isn't making too much of this too soon. But if this really does go to martial law, if this, if this trajectory continues, you are going to see police and military used to violate your fellow Americans. There are a lot more veterans than active duty, and we outnumber them sufficiently that if we decide to say, no, the veterans are going to step in and protect the American people from the U.S. military, we can do it. From the police, even, we can do it. And if we have to step in, we need to be ready to step up and put our bodies on the line if it comes to that. I don't think there are quite yet those circumstances. Right. But we just heard from New York City, and maybe, Larry, if you can confirm this, there are uh, black SUVs that are U.S. military driving around where they're getting ready for patrol lockdowns. I haven't seen uh, video evidence of that. No, I've seen a few I don't, people I don't, I don't think that. So. Most who don't know this about New York City. New York City is eight and a half million of us. Our police force is the 13th largest army in the world. Yeah. So we already have our own military police force. We just We have auxiliary yeah. cops also. We can bring up, and they look military. So yeah. people think they're military. They're actually not. They just look it. But well, it's just our police force. From the reports that I've heard, it was specifically U.S. military. But regardless of what's happening right now on the ground, what we're seeing from politicians is threats of mass activations. of. Oh, but hold on, guys. Right. The, the, just, just so people know this, there are also military already in New York City every day. There's, right. there, we literally have them uh, stationed in, in places like Grand Central Station, Penn Station, Madison Square Garden. 
they're stationed all the time. So there's military stationed in the city every day wait, already. Wait. We're, we're already living under a military occupation. That was since 9-11. <laughs> since 9-11, Adam. Yes, since 9-11, we have had, literally, if you walk through, and I've done it before, if you uh, see when I go through uh, Grand Central Station, there are three or four people. Most of them are reservists. They're activated reservists. They'll, they'll literally be in there, you know, full gear, full everything, and battle, three battle. or four of them be there. Yes, absolutely. So the, easily it could be any of them they've seen also. And, and this is just to go back to 9-11, all the things that were normalized post 9-11 are now being are now being used against us. The idea of a, of a soldier in a city standing patrol with it, with with the, with the, an M-16, that's not that's not a, I'm used to that now. I don't yes. I wouldn't give that a sec. I, oh, yeah, that sucks. That's still here. OK, um, yes, absolutely. But, uh, so, Adam, yeah, is so there something you want us to, to talk about right now? Besides, by the way, guys, if you want to help out, Adam, if you want to support him, if you want to ask him questions, you can go to Kokesh for president dot com. That's his website. Is there anything else you want to talk about regarding that can reaching out to you, connecting to you, Adam? Yeah. So there were uh, some thoughts on localization that we wanted to share Please. and the libertarian answer to this. And we can talk about the bigger abstracts of the free market and how it benefits the medical industry and how we're better able to respond in times of crisis like this. But since you said that there were some questions about my candidacy and, and I, I, anytime I'm introduced as a presidential candidate, I have to go, whoa, 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 hold on a second. I'm not a psychopath like everybody else trying to be president. My platform is fundamentally different. It's yes. throw the ring in the fire. Day one, we declare the federal government bankrupt uh, the constitution is null and void and we take it through a peaceful orderly responsible process that leaves us with 50 independent states and of course up to 562 sovereign native nations now one of the things that we're experiencing right now is lockdowns at the state and local level and yep. to my and, and it's unfortunate uh but it reinforces the moderate nature of my platform some people say that this is extreme Wait a minute. adam gokesh is moderate in I embarrass myself every time I have to point this out. This platform, while it is radical in the in the Henry David Thoreau sense, for every thousand striking at the branches of evil, there is one striking the root, and the root here is centralized coercive government. Uh, what I'm talking about is not extreme in terms of policy. It is really, truly, embarrassingly moderate. I love asking people who don't know these numbers because it, it is it is a eye opening uh, experience. How many people, uh, I'll, I'll ask you, I'll put you on the spot in case you haven't heard me say this before. Do you, do you know how many people work for government in the United States at all three levels, state, federal, and local? It's about Full one in seven Americans. Full-time employees. Um, it's it's less than that, 22 million out of 330 million. No, I'm sorry, so, of those working. It's about one in seven of those working. Oh, oh, oh sure, yeah, of the workforce. That's yes. That would be about right, yeah. yeah. So 22 million Americans out of 330 million that's that's still a, a lot. Yeah. Here's, here's the important question in regards to localization and this platform. Of these 22 million, how many, including active duty military, work for the federal government? Yeah, it's less than 15%. Three million out of 22 million. Yep. Most people assume it's way more. Because nope. the federal government does way more evil crap than everybody else. It's only three out of 22 million. My proposal about fifteen percent, right? Is that, did I have my math right? I think a little less, little less than one in seven. When 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 I make this proposal, what I'm saying is let's cut less than one in seven government jobs, three out of twenty two million. And most libertarians go, "What? Adam only wants to cut one seventh of the government?" <laughs> well, okay, one step. Yes, this is why I'm embarrassed, right? It's really moderate, one step at a time. And of these three million out of twenty two million that we're cutting. A lot of them are going to get absorbed by state and local governments anyway. So, yes, I am talking about cutting less than one in seven government employees and letting states do whatever they want. You're a liberal in a liberal state, a conservative in a conservative state. Guess what? Right now, you get more of what you want because government is customized. The ultimate goal, of course, in localization is to get government down to the community level. Sure. And this, this solves the silly anarchist minarchist divide. It's nonsense. If you're a voluntarist and ethical libertarian, that's what counts. You can have, and this is where I would say I and, and most of our movement have been communicating libertarianism 
incorrectly saying it's about issues, this issue, this issue, and then we mm -hmm. end up arguing over issues instead right. of uniting everybody to take issue with the fact that people are trying to force their will on us from thousands of miles away. Instead of saying government this, government that, should this, shouldn't that, can this, can't that, no. You can have as much or as little government as you want as long as it's voluntary. You want to be without a government entirely? That's only possible when we get government down so that it's so local, it can't stop you from declaring mm -hmm. your independence and opting out on your own. And only at that point are we ever truly free. And this is such a uniting message. Mm -hmm. We don't have to argue aesthetics. We don't have to argue opinions or hypotheticals. It's, do you want more of what you want? Well, yes, because I want it. Of course I want that. Of course, I, I want something. I'm going to want more of it. Duh. You know, and it's like, this is the everybody gets what they want strategy. So as to the viral situation that we're experiencing right now, this goes to the open borders question, right? Open or closed borders? Nonsense. Neither. It's what's a legitimate border? Private property borders, community borders that are formed voluntarily. Those are legitimate borders. And that's the only time you're ever going to be able to have effective border control at all. You can't trust the government to do it on some massive scale. They will always fail. They will always be corruptible. And then you lose your right to freedom of disassociation. If you want to live in a community where there are no Muslims or Mexicans like Donald Trump, okay, fine. How are you going to get that? Not by trying to control everybody in a huge territory. You're going to get it on your property in a community of like-minded people. That's it. So if there was an ability or, or a need to quarantine effectively, actually quarantine an area. Like Donald Trump, oh, we're going to ban travel from Europe. Are you kidding me? Oh, but no, uh, Americans can come home. If you have the virus, you can come home and bring it here. But we're going to stop just the economic feature of travel between the United States. And really? Really? Like, it's just, it's absurd on its face to say, no, we're going to stop the spread of the virus by limiting this travel, but not all of this travel, and not having an effective quarantine in the middle where you can say people are actually effectively prevented from being exposed but is it, to the virus. But, but to be forward, isn't there an issue that when this kind of crisis pops up, that people are just irrationally afraid? And one big dad says, don't worry, sweetheart, I got you. I'm gonna make sure these evil Europeans don't come over. Even though that's not real, doesn't it make the person who's afraid feel better? Doesn't it calm them down? Is there or is there not? It's an open question. Some value in something like that. Is, is there value in symbolism to deal with the fear or no? Yes. After the government breaks your leg, you're better off when it gives you a crutch. But true. you'd be better off without having your leg broken in the first place. Also you would be true. better off not being frightened into a panic by people who are gonna profit from that panic. You would be better off with a localized community-based government with transparency, with accountability. And that, again, the, the, the lack of, like when we trust government to handle this information, they slow it down. They prevent us from making rational decisions in response to a threat, and they exacerbate the fear and uncertainty. One of the greatest things about localizing government, even in the preliminary phases, is that it becomes a scale more transparent and accountable. And that is gonna make all of these things a lot easier to deal with. We can deal with them rationally and effectively. Again, with localization, I have been shocked, even as I've been advocating this over the last uh, several years, specifically as, as a pres you know, national policy as, as part of a presidential platform, uh, every stone I, uh, I turn over, it's like, wow, it's great for that too. And I'll just give you a quick example. I was in California speaking at a CalExit, California Independence Movement event uh, a few weeks ago. And one of the concerns was, hey, well, if, if California breaks off from the rest of the country, it's going to go more liberal. And people who are conservative or libertarian in California who don't like living there already, but they have to for work or family or for the weather, whatever it is, they go, oh, crap, I don't want California to go independent. The federal government is restraining them from going super liberal. Nonsense. Think about it for just a second. California goes independent. If you live in California and it's going to have a certain amount of liberalism in the state government, do you want that state government to be empowered by the federal fiat currency system, regulatory system, corporatist policies, 
all of these things, the, the legal system that protects corporations, that protects government officials, that you're tied into with the force of the federal government, protecting state government officials from accountability? No, of course not. That makes the liberalness of the state government of California way more vicious, destructive, costly, way more fraud, waste, and abuse. If you're a, liberal, a libertarian or a conservative, there's any kind of fiscal conservative in California, California goes independent, it might get a little more liberal in flavor, but your experience actually is better for you in fiscally conservative terms where the ripoff is radically reduced because it's transparent, it's efficient, it's effective, it's accountable in its liberalism. It makes everything, but localizing government, just everything. And now, hey, now we have another example, virus outbreak, bio crisis. Yes, localization is good for that too, across the board in every way from reasonable, rational responses, not having the fear carried away, not having people in a position to take advantage of you because you've been scared, being able to marshal resources effectively to take care of people in a community. Just every, every aspect of this is better with localization. I love it, I love it. All right, look, I wanna say thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Uh, we took about an hour of your time. I know you're gonna be back on again uh, today at 3 p.m., is that right? Yes, thank you for that plug. And we've got already, We've got some questions. My my wife is feeding me here from, we are watching the questions in the live. Oh, do you want to answer the question now? Go ahead, please do it. Oh, well, if there, are, if there are more, if there are anything that have caught your eye that you want to get into, it's your show, brother. No, no, no. Do you want to answer the question real fast? Go ahead. I, I don't want to keep it any longer. Sure. I know you got to sure. go, but no, answer no, no. a question. Go ahead. Answer I'll, a question. I'll just, do, I'll just do one. Go ahead. Um, and wrap it up. And this is from Aaron Kruth. Everyone describes a successful campaign differently. White House or bust, 5% of the popular vote, winning an electoral vote, retaining ballot access, growing the party X percent. How does Adam define a successful campaign and how do we get there? That's a great question for libertarians to be looking at right now. And I think we should be always shooting for the main goal, which is victory. If we don't have a reason plan for victory, we are hamstringing ourselves on all of those goals leading up to that. If we put someone forward who doesn't have a serious platform, and I would say none of the other candidates do. I know that's, that's getting really intra-party partisan view. Oh, but Adam, no. But really, if you, I'm going to be a libertarian president, and I'm going to stop George Soros from crashing the dollar and blaming me for it, and I'm going to get Congress complete. No, it's nonsense. You have to have a platform based on a fundamental paradigm shift with practical policy that you can carry out on day one and say, this is what's going to happen. I believe this platform. I completely agree with you, man. The, the issue that if you saw when I ran, I ran to win. And even though I didn't win, since I ran to win, I was able to gain other benefits, right? So yes. running to win will give you other things. If you win, I might have won. That would have been amazing if I'd won, right? But right. even though I didn't win, I was able to gain other things because I wasn't shooting just for this. I yes. was shooting for this yes. Yes. and then I got this, yes. right? So, so I think I agree with you. You've got to, you have to run to win completely. So in that vein, what we are doing with this platform, the immediate objective that we know would make us successful is that if we get this message in front of the American people sufficiently in 2020, such that every single American has to have an opinion by 24, hey, would mm -hmm. America be better off without the federal government? Because if this is an idea whose time has come, we will win in 24. I think we can win in 20. I think it's an outside possibility. But I define success in 2020 as getting that message out. If the American people are ready for it in 2020, and this is the excitement that we see with all of this social upheaval, with the government having this spasm of evil, stupid destructiveness around the coronavirus, this could be the black swan that makes America look for an alternative outside of the two-party system in a serious way. And the, the Libertarian Party, we have to step up to this opportunity and nominate someone, not just who has existing name ID, who has command presence, uh, who can get this message out in an effective way, but also who has a practical plan that doesn't have any holes in it or, or big questions. Well, what about this? No, we have answered all those questions. This is a very reasonable, practical policy. My goal in that sense is 10%. And a lot of people say, no, I, we have 5%. That would be huge. That would be a breakout year for the LP. Well, again, I think that would also achieve the goal of planting the flag on this idea. Sure. But if we, I think we should be shooting for 10%. I think as a, as a real, I, we're running to win. 
But what's our step towards winning? Well, we got to get to 10% first. If we hit 10% in 20, that'll set us up for victory in 24. And I, I, I think if we, if we fail in that, you know, we, we are going to be setting ourselves back. If we nominate another washed up Republican type or, or play it safe, like you were saying, no, this is an opportunity. We have to be appropriately bold for the opportunity as libertarians, as I think we should have been throughout our history as a party, actually uh, standing up for our principles, not compromising, because when we stick to our principles, we find that we end up with the most pragmatic solutions. Principles are pragmatic. That's the point of having principles. And Larry, I know that you're someone who has been a strong voice for that in the party. And, and you have done a beautiful job of, as, as I feel that I am uh, I'm doing right now, helping to bridge these divides within the movement to say, look, it's about voluntarism. It's about the ethical foundation. And when we can pull together in the same direction, we can all pull together. This is a great opportunity for the LP one way or another for 2020. Um, if, if people want to join me, we're going to be doing more questions and answers this afternoon at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern. Please join us right here, facebook.com slash Adam Charles Kokesh, my personal page, and, and we can get into all of this. Um, I am still, uh, the, 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 to go back, the, there are two big immediate questions for me, Larry. One, you know, how, how do we flatten the curve of tyranny? How do we flatten the curve of martial law, make sure that this doesn't have huge long-term disastrous effects and uh, you know what my immediate response should be. Should I go to New York? Should I go to DC? Should I go somewhere just centrally located and, and, and keep spreading this message online? Should I bug out to my property in Arizona? And uh, that's a big question for a lot of people right now. Yeah. So let's come together and answer these questions and, and, and have a good strong conversations we know we're capable of. Perfect. Adam, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. My Alrighty, pleasure, guys. Brother. Thank you so much. Peace Have love, an awesome day. See Adam today at 3 p.m. Talk to you guys.